Hello and welcome to another virtual event with Tattered Cover. For those of you who don't know this bookstore, we are Colorado's largest independent bookstore based right here in Denver. We have been open for 50 years and it's thanks to readers like you out there supporting us and the writers that are gonna be joining me in a second um, that we were able to stay open for half a century and we have expanded. We have a new children's only location. We have a new location right across the street from where the Rockies play baseball. And down the road, pretty soon, we'll be opening one in Westminster. So if you're local to Denver, you know where Westminster is. We'll be having that new location shortly. Stay tuned. Before I go any further, uh, I want to thank you. By I am Adam. I'm the director of events. And this is a huge night for us. We are so excited to have everyone here. If you need closed captioning or want it, it is at the bottom of your YouTube screen. There's a button that says CC. Just click that for if you want or need closed captioning. If you love virtual events and want to keep supporting Tattered Cover, go to tatteredcover.com slash event, and you'll see all the events we have upcoming, including next Tuesday, we have Giles Milton. I feel like if you're a fan of the book we're discussing tonight, you'll be a fan of that, even though it's not fiction. But tonight, I'm so excited. We have Sandra Brown discussing her brand new book, Blind Tiger, with Lisa Scottolini. Sandra, if you didn't know, is the author of 71 New York Times bestsellers, including Thick as Thieves, Outbox, Tailspin, Seeing Red, Sting, Mean Streak, Friction, Deadline, and Rainwater. She has been writing professionally since 1981 and has published over 80 novels and has upwards of 80 million copies of her books in print worldwide. Her work has been translated into 34 languages. If that wasn't enough, her episode on True TV's Murder by the Book premiered the series in 2008. She appeared in 2010 on the Investigative Discovery series Hardcover Mysteries. Television movies have been made about her novels. She is basically all over the world and is one of the foremost writers. Uh, she has served as president of the Mystery Writers of America and in 2008. She was named the Thriller Master, the top award given to the International Thriller by the International Thriller Writers Association. And in conversation with her is someone just as uh, legendary. We have Lisa Scottolini, who is a number one best-selling author, a New York Times uh, for, on the New York Times. She's an Edgar Award-winning author of 33 novels, including her latest called Eternal, which is her first historical novel. Uh, she reviews fiction and nonfiction and has appeared in the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Philadelphia Inquirer. She has served as president of the Mystery Writers of America. And has taught a course she developed called Justice in Fiction at the University of Pennsylvania Law School, which is her alma mater. That's a lot to say. These are two of the biggest writers in the world right now. Please welcome Sandra Brown and Lisa Scottolini. Hello, Adam. Thank yes. you. Of course. Thank you so much. I will hop off. You two take over. Everyone's here to see you. I will come back on with audience questions in about 30 minutes, but uh the floor is yours. Thank you, Adam. Thank you, Tattered. Thank you to the amazing Sandra Brown, someone I feel very, very lucky and honored to call my girlfriend, but also one of my favorite authors. I'm sure one of yours too. Thank you all for being here. This book, Blind Tiger, is amazing. I love all of her work. Um, but I think you're going to get to see, and you probably know this if you've been to her signings before, what a warm, loving, generous, yeah. brilliant, funny, great, broad <laughs> she is. <laughs> well, thank you. I, I, I adore thank you. Thank you, Lisa, and, and back at you. Uh, you know, I, I, I came to know Lisa Scottolini when you gave me, in the Washington Post, a great review for Ricochet. Ricochet. And I remember reading that review and said, I need to know this lady. I need to know this lady. And that was years and years ago. And I've had the privilege of knowing you and your precious daughter. And it's been a, a joy to my life to oh, have you in it. Well, <laughs> look, I've been reading you. I love you. You're one of my favorite authors on the planet. And that review is easy to write, as would this one be. Blind Tiger, I just loved it. What's you know, you are doing, you're such a terrific writer. You're such a terrific storyteller, plotter, character. The dialogue is great. The setting is great. There's so much to talk about with this novel. And so we'll just launch right in. Yes. Fair enough? 
Why fire you, away. I guess I just want to say, let's tell them the basics of what it's about, because there's two really terrific characters. A typical Sandra Brown heroine, strong, <laughs> feisty, sassy, in Laurel, and she meets Thatcher Hutton. Do you want to tell us the basic headline of the plot? Well, it's about 1920, 1920, 100 years ago when I wrote it in 2020. And I wanted to get away from everything that was going on in 2020. So I just Googled 1920s, what was happening? <laughs> <laughs> this is what I mean about down to earth. <laughs> you know what? It, it, nothing had changed. Soldiers were coming home from World War I with post-traumatic stress. It hadn't even been named that. It was called shell shock. The women's movement, we had Me Too. They had the suffrage movement. They had just gotten the vote. Um, there was a pandemic of Spanish flu <laughs> globally killing people by the hundreds of thousands. And I'm like, why does all this sound so familiar? Oh, right. <laughs> Even 100 years ago, we were going through the same stuff. But I thought, wouldn't it be interesting to go back and draw the parallels between that society and our society? Because the societal questions were all the same. And as if that weren't bad enough, you couldn't buy a drink. <laughs> 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 because prohibition went into effect in January, on January 16th of 1920. So I thought, okay, prohibition, that's, that just sparked all the creative juices. And I thought, that's an interesting thing. You don't read a lot about it. So then I did prohibition in Texas. And <laughs> it was like moonshining had been an industry forever, but in January of 1920, it became the industry to be in because the boom, the demand was awesome. And so that's where I got the idea for the story. But I wanted Laurel, going back to, I told you a question would be worth five minutes. Go right ahead, dear. I, this is, I love it. But uh, um, going back to Laurel, uh, because it was a very important time in women's history in America and the, the flip that was made with suffrage. Um, and also they had taken over a lot of the workforce for the soldiers who left for World War I. So they had been out of the home. They were not only ironing and washing and cooking, they had gotten jobs. So when the men came home, it was like, well, you know what? We're kind of, we kind of like this. We kind of like the independence. Our own spending money gave us. And so I thought I wanted Laurel to be a very strong character. She suffers two right, right. tragedies back to back. She could have succumbed. She could have totally just said, okay, you know, I'll go back to my parents. So, you know, the, but she resolved to take control of her own destiny, right. of her own life. I will never be, it's, I will never be dependent on anyone else again, nor will I let my life be dictated by the whims of someone else. My challenge as a writer, you'll understand this, Lisa, is that while she's kind of brittle, and while she's strong, I still wanted her to be likable. I still wanted her to have that softness about her, that um, giving, that vulnerability. And so that when she meets Thatcher, you know, the, it, it, he's the one she is most guarded against, and yet there's still that vulnerability to her. So it, it, it became a real writing challenge for me, and I even called my editor about it, and I said, you know, after he'd read the first, you know, 150 pages or so, I said, is she likable? Will people like her, or is she so guarded? He said, no, because you show it with her father-in-law. You show it with the 
young prostitute, you show her giving nature with these other characters even before Thatcher. So, right. and I, Thatcher, I mean, let's face it, we all want Thatcher to walk, want <laughs> Thatcher to walk into our backyard, right? <laughs> I mean, there's so much to say. I loved Laurel. I loved her as a character. I thought she was so relatable and we won't give anything away, but what she goes through, she's so practical. And I also thought, you know, what you have done in this novel is so profoundly awesome. And just speaking as an author, you know, the, just the writerly, the deftness of it. For example, you you say, I love this part when she's looking through the want ads. And I think every woman has been there. You know, yeah. and it happens on page 146. And everybody can relate to that, men too. Where she's sitting there and she goes, you know, she wasn't qualified to teach school. She doesn't know about switchboards. And you also see the jobs open to women required secretary skills she doesn't have. You know that I think all of these societal and historical facts that you mm -hmm. just infuse the novel in a very seamless way. It's not like, now we're going to talk about opportunities for women. You know, oh, I'm so it's glad so you brilliantly done. Really, I just sat there and I was marveling, even the prohibition, all of it. To go back to what you said at the beginning, when you say in the novel, it says, um, moonshining is Texas best kept secret. You know, that you're right that even though these things, the themes are so resonant today, but you also, it's a bit of a high wire act. I can say as just another author, I want readers to know that you managed to make it timeless, but also specific. It's Foley, Texas. It has a small town sheriff. It has a, a kind of moonshine, very like a war. Yeah. And this young woman who's been through hell, trying to make her way. And then we talk about Thatcher, because I really thought that I think you're so good at so many things, because this novel is sort of a historical fiction, but also a historical mystery, a thriller as well. Like, so many balls are in the air and when thatcher comes along we understand why she's guarded but we also understand why she's attracted and i'm so curious if you i don't even answer how you do that but the spark between them he's clever he's funny they instantly get each other when they meet i mean how do you do that i just think it's remarkable <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I I never do a, I know authors and it's perfectly fine because we all have our writing, you know, habits, our, our right. modus operandi. But I, when, when I do a character, I have a vague idea of, of who or what they're going to be. But when they walk onto the page, they totally take over. And so when he when he gets in trouble on the boxcar and he has to jump off the train, um, <laughs> it's like, okay, this guy didn't go looking for that confrontation. In fact, he was very disinclined to do it. But it said early on, if you push his button far enough, you don't mess with him. You're mm -hmm. going to get in trouble if you mess with him. So I kind of saw him as a young Gary Cooper. <laughs> nobody, <laughs> nobody remembers. I get him, that. But <laughs> I'm with you, girl. <laughs> <laughs> he was the stoic, you know, cowboy, had that laconic mannerism, but that cowboy code. You mm -hmm. may have to yes. do the wrong thing for the right reason. Right. And so right away, you know that he's a man with honor. You know he's a man that doesn't go looking for trouble, but that if it's called for, he you don't mess with him. And so I I kind of put him in that place, and then he took over the the scenes. And I think that his falling in love with Laurel was instantaneous, as I think it happens with a man. It's either there immediately or it never is. A man can court a woman and she eventually can fall in love with him. I think for a man, it happens or it ain't ever gonna happen. <laughs> <laughs> and so, well, you're happily married and I'm happily divorced, so I believe you. <laughs> I have no idea what men want to think. But, but I love but, that you, you, you brought that out. Go ahead, I'm sorry. Well, I just wanted him to be a character with honor because when he meets her, 
he assumes she's married and um and he abides by that and mm -hmm. and and i also and this was interesting Lisa, because you know now men and women talk to each other differently than yes. they did <laughs> a hundred years ago. And these were two basically moral people. So I had to, to write it in a way that would not overstep what the mores of the time were. Agree. And you did that beautifully. Like still I love that scene have, going on. Still have that sexual tension that, you know, so. Right, anyway, right. You see them like, pull away, but get together. And then, you know, their their conversation, all of your dialogue is always so pitch perfect, especially as to place. And, um, you know, when he says, I, I like your sass, you know, I just love that because <laughs> that's like, he's not gonna give some big exegesis, but he's go that's what he's gonna say. And also I thought you, another deft touch was the fact that her, her late husband, and also he, you know, that they're both veterans, yeah. that there was a war. And what that does, as you said, shell shock, you know, you see in him the effects again with you have a very light authorial touch with that. It becomes part of the character and who they are. And I thought that was beautifully done. Did you did you have to research World War One or how did that work? I, I, I had to research everything and I appreciated going back to what you said just a few minutes ago about the the research being invisible because to me, that is the best research. And you said you didn't drop into, okay, now let's talk about women's issues in this time in history. Right. Um, and, and, and so every time I wrote anything, and I'll give you a good example. This, this is a funny example, but it's good. I had her floorboarding her 1915 Model T at, at one point. Well, what I know about Model T is you could put in a thimble. I mean, <laughs> so I had to learn to drive a Model T, but furthermore, I had to drive a 1915 model. So when I went to it, I started looking at all, watching all the YouTube videos on it and studying the diagrams and everything. And what I found out is that the accelerator, there are three pedals, the clutch, reverse, and the brake. Those three, left, middle, right. There was no accelerator on the floor. The accelerator was on the steering wheel. And so when I said she floorboarded, I had to go back and go, no. <laughs> so it was things like that that I had to know. Mm -hmm. But I could have waxed eloquent about all of this and the reader wouldn't care because anything that draws the reader out of the story is it ain't dead right. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's supposed to be where I have to know it and I can incorporate it into the story. But I wanted and there was research about the moonshine. There were how do you make moonshine? I was going to ask you that. <laughs> you How obviously you learned it, and I thought, goodbye. <laughs> and so it was like all of these things that I would have to stop and go, wait a minute. Did did Americans use that idiom in 1920, or was that a later thing? There could be no allusions to like aircraft or space or what we, you know, like out of this world. There were things that they wouldn't have said then. Right, right. And, and so I, I had to stop and look all that up, but I wanted it to be a part of the story, not something that showed off how smart I was. Right, <laughs> no, you're right. Or, or sort of trying to educate people. And this plot is so compelling. You know, we're just sort of talking about the relationship between the characters, but they find themselves in the middle of a straight up missing person. Murder, and I think you so convincingly, um, you know, the stakes are high. Yeah. Someone goes missing, we're worried about her, we're, and they find themselves, I don't think I'm giving anything away, on opposite sides of the law to a certain extent, yeah. which was so great. I also thought, and I want to take a second to pause because this is something else that I think you did masterfully. I think it's hard in historical fiction to deal with issues of law and justice. 
-hmm. And you're, all the minor characters are so terrific. Like at one point, the sheriff says something like, you know, uh, well, as long as you keep the peace and nobody bleeds over much, that's sort of a lot. <laughs> that is pretty good. I think that's pretty much all the <laughs> <laughs> and I thought that was just so kind of one of those sentences that that's what's so great about your dialogue that it first it, it describes character at the same time it defines place and time and then later a very modern you know this ended up being historical but very modern at the same time as I say for example later on I'm not giving anything away again when he says I used to think the difference between right and wrong was clear cut law and justice meant the same thing but I'm not sure of that anymore mm -hmm. I thought that was just so profound in the context of this novel, which we won't reveal, but what, what made you get to that point? Because I thought that was a very, um, you know, it was just a timeless insight. And it's sort of what we were talking about Thatcher's carry, character early um, is that he had, he, he had lived by a code and he, he reveals that he was a sharpshooter. Mm -hmm. He could, you know, uh, quick draw, do what, because he had been a cowboy and it was a matter of, of, uh, life preservance. I mean, if you saw a rattlesnake or a coyote or a bobcat or something, you know, it was, or wrestler and, and you were defending yourself. All of those things went into play in his character, but then when it was called upon, for him to defend other people and when it came to whose life, you know, can, and I guess it's like, who needs killing? <laughs> you know, <laughs> to who doesn't. And, and uh, I think he had to come to that point where he had lived by a code steeped in him by his mentor for all of his developing years. And then all of a sudden that's tested. And he was like, what is right and wrong? And how do you divide that? Because it becomes a moral dilemma. And to me, to Sandra Brown, the writer who started a long time ago, every single novel I've ever written has a moral dilemma for the character because that is where we all live on a daily basis. How do we choose what to do, what to follow, who to listen to, who not to, who to heed, who not to? We live daily in a bubble of moral dilemma. That's true. <laughs> It's constantly having to choose between gray, gray areas, you know, and we would like to think, as Thatcher did, well, everything's either black or white, you know, the bad guys, the good guys, you do this, you do that, but they're, but on a daily basis, and, and especially in past few years, we all are tested every day. What's the right thing to do and what's the wrong thing to do? And not always is the right thing the law. It may be you may have to compromise on that a little bit. And I think the compromise is what makes a character interesting. When it comes down to the compromise and it's a life or death situation, how do you choose? And that what to me, that's what makes all fiction interesting is putting that character in that decision where they have to, to choose. I mean, Atticus Finch was one of the best characters because he was a moral, I mean, it was a moral decision that he made and he followed through with it. And it was a dilemma for him, you know, right. because of all where he was and in that point in time and, you know, everything. So <clears throat> that to me is a really important facet of, of writing fiction is putting your character in a moral dilemma. What would that character do? Right. That's so, it's such a, you can see that shining through in this book. And I think also it extends, if we can pause for a minute to the minor characters, you know, there's a, a, a woman who's uh, the doctor's wife, who's German. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> and we, you touch very, once again, just a brilliantly deft touch because there's actual prejudice against her, her accent. Now, and, and to, that's an interesting moral question in itself. You know, how do we treat people who are other? And you explore right. it very, very lightly. Um, the same, interestingly, with the 17 year old who is unfortunately, you know, that's prostituted. I mean, can I let you in on a, on a, on a secret? Please do. Uh, first of all, when I when I started this book, I had no idea what it was going to be. What, I, I had no idea what the story was going to be. And these characters walked on to the page as, as I needed them. The bootlegger, uh, Chester, the the sheriff. Uh, the Gert, Love it. Gert. Gert. Hadn't thought of her. And I kept referring to this young prostitute who had been beaten up seriously injured didn't even give her a name until long into the book and she showed up <laughs> she just came up i would i never planned for her to be a character and she just showed up and said take me with you don't make me go back well it just complicated things for the hero and he was like get in you know get in and then how how Laurel was going to treat her. And Corinne then became such a pivotal character in the Absolutely. novel. Absolutely, right. And I had no idea. And the twins hadn't planned on them. Uh, and when they showed up, I was like, gosh, I love these guys. And, and they became pivotal characters in the novel. But I don't I don't sit down to, I, I don't do an outline. I just kind of start with my premise and, and see where it goes. And these characters show up and I think, gosh, where have you been all my life? You're wonderful. <laughs> I love you. <laughs> whether, whether they're good or bad, you know, right. whether they're good or bad. Well, they're so, they fill out this beautiful, it's like a frieze or a pastiche, which these minor characters, because they also reflect they reflect choice, they make their own choices, and they reflect choices that the other characters make so that they buttress the whole novel. For example, the way Thatcher relates to her, tells us about her and tells us about Thatcher. Equally, I thought small point, but I, I am a, I'm a horse person. And when Thatcher is a horse trainer, right. and, and the way he relates to the animals, um, so, so much about him, nothing is wasted, nothing is superfluous. And the way they relate to Corinne too, you're like, your heart goes out, but you never uh, take it over the top, which that's not an easy trick. I mean, to write a really <laughs> heartfelt, emotional novel. I mean, I cried, I was like, oh. <laughs> I was rooting for I'm like, please God, you know? <laughs> so I don't want to give it anything away, but there's so many twists and turns that I, you can't set it down. It succeeds brilliantly as a page turner, as a mystery, as a thriller, and also historical fiction. I don't want to circle back because, you know, were you nervous that you like, you, you know, you met, you said, oh, I'm going to write something a hundred years ago. I think you can do anything. I've always thought that. Um, and, but I wonder, were, were you nervous? Were you like, oh my God, I don't know if I can do historical oh. fiction? Well, first of all, uh, we've talked about this before. Um, I, I face a wall of fear every day. I mean, when I come to this keyboard, it's like a firing squad. Oh. Um, <laughs> and I know I'm, I'm always very nervous, but this was a gamble and, um, and when I called my editor, and I was I was I was in lockdown two months by myself, away from my family by a thousand miles, I got stuck and I couldn't get home because all the airlines shut down. After Amelia Island, when we were together, after Amelia Island, I went to our place in South Carolina, and I got stuck there and I couldn't get home and to travel that far would have meant an overnight stay in a hotel, which I didn't want to do. And so I just thought, well, I've got to think of another book. So I just will sit here and do that. <laughs> so that's when I started thinking about, well, I don't want to write about COVID and I don't want to write about this and whatever the headlines, the news, well, I was just saturated with bad stuff. And I thought, okay, I'll, I'll, what was happening? 
So I called my editor and I said, you know, I'm if if I'm yearning for an escape from what we're all going through, I think my readers will be yearning for that same kind of departure. And he said, well, what do you have in mind? And I said, well, how about prohibition in Texas? <laughs> and he goes, oh. <laughs> <laughs> And so I started talking about it, and I think he could tell through the research. I just thought and most of the story, I mean, this blind tiger is mild compared to what really happened. And it was like I'd read these accounts, and I'd go, you can't make this stuff up. Right. And so I said, you know, I started telling him, and he said, well, I can hear the excitement in your voice. I can hear, and I said, I think it would be a good change of pace. And and that was was where all my creative juices were going at the time. He said that I have to listen to my authors. If they say this is what I want to write, then that's what they should write. So go for it. And and but it was I knew it was going to be. And then I read. Well, Lisa Scottolini is doing a historical. You know, wow. Oh, very good. I felt the same way. I was like, well, I don't know what I'm doing, but, but when you were actually writing it, did, did it feel that it doesn't, didn't feel in a way, I think I taught myself that it isn't really that different. It's not so different. The, the, young, the only thing that was different was, as I said, every time I type a sentence about a kerosene lamp or a cola, I had to stop go to see who had electricity, who didn't, in 1920s Texas, where the book was set, where the railroad ran, how far did the railroad go, what rail line would he be on? I mean, it was all those kinds of things I had to stop and check out, fact check. But basically, the story unfolded as, as most of mine do. And I have to tell you, I had a hell of a good time. I just, I thought it was, I loved the characters sure. and I just had a good time. And I think the change of pace was kind of rejuvenating. It was kind of, you know, fun. Um, the, the main challenge was the research, um, having to stop and think about it more than just writing about, you know, contemporary America. Um and the other thing was I couldn't let uh, I couldn't let them cross a line that a man and a woman of that time would not cross. I didn't think. Um, and so, you know, we've got the the whorehouse and we have the madam and we've got the young prostitute and all of that. But um, so there was plenty of hanky panky going on. But I had to to build in that yearning and that sexual tension that is kind of a Sandra Brown trademark, I think, after all these years, Great. and and still keep them true to the time. I think that's so well said. That was just how I felt. First of all, I felt your joy. It's like a <laughs> rollicking good time, this book. You know, moonshiners and missing people and love and wonderful sex scene and real love. It's just, it was about, it was a love. It was that they find each other, and I don't want to give it anyway, but I thought, um, well, I guess I, also, I don't also um, love that there's no cell phones. Uh, yeah, right. I exactly. love. What I, a relief. Oh, there's my a God. The pain of a fiction writer's resistance because you cannot disappear people anymore. <laughs> right. And also a reader. As a reader, it is such a yeah. pleasure. You really get lost. And yet, like, your instinct was dead on accurate. I was like, it becomes a timeless story, but there's not anybody checking their laptop or right. their texts. If they figure stuff out, they have to do it by their wits, by good old fashioned detective work. And he's terrifically smart and she is too. And they are just so good together, but we don't know if they're going to get together. <laughs> and, <laughs> and it was like, ah, I love it. I just loved it. I think you were... Oh. Oh my God! First of all, I always feel the, I love your novels, but you, I, I, it was inspired, and it's just a really compelling. I just haven't read anything like it. Well, actually, ever because I, uh, I'm oh, not well, in the nineteen twenties, and I, I thought it just sold the love story and the historical. I was I learned a lot about prohibition. I learned about about Texas. Um, I learned how to make a pie. Um, you know, I mean, it was just. 
This is just great. I mean, it just, uh, are you going to do an, are more historical fiction coming from you? I know I, you I know I have to ask that. They all want to know it and I want to know it. Well, there, there are some, there's a lot, you know, um, things on the table that have to be thought out, but I'm not saying no, but I'm not committing, but I can say it was a lot of fun and I, I would love to do some more, but we'll see. Well, I hope you do because I, I, whatever you write, I love, but I loved Blind Tiger and thank you, friend. Thank you for bringing it to the world. Thank yes. you. And, and Lisa's absolutely right, Sandra. So many people want to know about historical fiction or returning to present day. Um, Joe asks, are you returning to present day with your next book? Uh, well, what does Joe want me to do? <laughs> Uh, no, um, Sandra wants to know what do you want her to do, and as we wait for him to uh, well, respond. Well, I no, I uh, I think you have to to write uh, for for as long as I've been doing this, which is a really long time. This is my fortieth year mm -hmm. um, of being published, and um, I have always played close attention to my gut instinct, and when the Story, I always feel like I, I don't create anything. I feel like the story is there. And these characters step out of my subconscious and say, write about us, we're interesting. And that their story is always there. It's up to me to excavate it, to give it, you know, to, to the readers. So um, we'll, we'll see where that... Um, that gut instinct goes. But I will say, as I've said to Lisa, I, I really had a good time uh, writing this book. And Lisa, Joe's question was also directed towards you. Will you be venturing back into modern times? I'm guessing this is our friend Joe, Sandra, by the way. <laughs> I bet this is Joe Myers. <laughs> Hello, friend Joe. <laughs> and he's a brilliant reviewer and, and reader and writer too. So, um, and a journalist. Uh, yeah, I am. I just finished the next domestic thriller, but I'm going to go back to historical too. I I felt like you, Sandra. You said it just for me. I loved it. It's fun and different and cool. Mm -hmm. And then Lena asks, um, "When did you come up with Blind Tiger as the title? Because it's perfect for this. Was that really early on? It was early on. Uh, actually, I um, was doing my research on prohibition, and I came across that term. And I went, blind tiger, what, what does that mean? And come to find out it was another term for a speakeasy or a business that fronts as a place where they sell or manufacture illegal whiskey. And it really didn't originate in the United States. It was in 18, the 1850s in England, and they used that term. And there are still bars in America, one famous one in Charleston, South Carolina, that's called Blind Tiger. But mm -hmm. furthermore, Lena, was it? I, uh, I thought Blind Tiger would look so good on a cover. And I loved the alliteration. And I loved the, um, it, was, it was interesting. If I just called it speakeasy, you know, the reader would have known right away, but I thought it would be an alluring title. And then um, our art director found this amazing font uh, for the title. And so it all just fit in together. Mm -hmm. And Lena also asked, it, it sounds like you're always fact checking and always checking things to make sure it's accurate. Are you also writing down notes where the story is headed so you don't lose your thoughts? Like, how do you keep track of everything that's going on? Uh, sometimes I I will uh, I will say what I know, <laughs> and I'll write down what I know so far, and then I will kind of plan on what has to happen next. Um, I ascribe to a book called. Um, written by a guy named Chris Vogler, and it's called The Writer's Journey. And he, he, it's like the elements of a saga or the elements of the myth. And it's the archetypal characters. It's the 
the format that a story should take. And he suggests you build in um, peaks. And so I kind of plan where I know those peaks are going to be, which in other words mean twist or turns or where you've got the reader going one way and then all of a sudden flip. Mm. Um, and so I kind of build in a few of those, but I have to say, and Lisa can relate to this, I'm certain, um, that some of the best surprises shock the hell out of me. I mean, I'm just like, <laughs> I didn't see that coming. I didn't know that was going to happen. And I referred to the showing up of Corinne, I didn't know that she was going to show up at that point in time and become such a pivotal character. So that's the fun of being a fiction writer is that um, you get to play make-believe and sometimes the surprises are the biggest joke on you. You think you've got it all planned out and that something happens that's so much better. So I think my characters are a lot smarter than I am. <laughs> And so as I go along, I do take reams of notes and, and I'll say, what are the stakes? What are the stakes here for this character? Um, how is that going to differ from the other character? So I do make notes because I know the essentials of plotting. Um, but, you know, it's a it's a daily exercise. I'm still I'm still am trying to learn how to do it. <laughs> <laughs> And then I'll, I'll end with this. Um, you both have storied careers. I mean, everyone who's read a book has knows both of your names. What do you wish you knew writing your first book that you know now this far into your career? Do you want to go first, Lisa? I <laughs> know. <laughs> um, I wish I knew uh, that you that you shouldn't expect. I think it's good to understand that it's never going to get easier <laughs> that and that it to expect it to be hard that sometimes i think people and that's why i love sandra i love everything about sandra but i love how down to earth she is about her process because i, I really would encourage people who are there today to write if they want to write you know you don't have to go to any school we just some ladies that started writing and but i do think when you see authors sometimes you think well, the, it's really easy and it, the words just flow. And we're like, no, that's never true. Like, I love when she says it's a wall of fear. I feel that way a lot. I was like, oh my God, what's gonna happen next? The hardest thing is what happens next. So the thing I finally have taught myself, don't expect this to be easy. It's gonna be really hard. And that's a good, that's okay. Mm -hmm. uh, and, I, and I would echo that perfectly. Um, I think that, um, I, Recently, well, I say recently, it was before COVID. And I was at a conference um, in New York, I think, and um, at Book Expo or something. But I was on a panel with some uh, other writers who were like decades younger. I felt like, you know, the granny lady of the whole panel. <laughs> when they start saying legendary or venerable, you know. <laughs> And so this young panelist afterward came up and she said, um, what advice would you give me? And I said, how hard do you want to work? You've got to decide how hard you want to work mm -hmm. because I said, it never gets easier. Just, and so uh, be prepared to give up stuff. There are sacrifices that you will make if you want to you know, pursue this for a long, for the long term. And, um, and I, when I come to work every day, it's like, I've never done it before. <laughs> I have exactly to start from right. scratch every single day. And I, and I think one has to be prepared to accept that, you know, that it, that it is masochistic. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you both, Sandra and Lisa, for joining Tattered Covers tonight uh, virtually. I wish it was in person, but maybe next book. Maybe <laughs> next this, year. Yeah. Right. Together. Um, right. Everyone who's here probably knows who both of you are, but where can we find you on the internet? I always like to end with that as well. Where can we find you? What's the best way? Oh, sandrabrown.net or sandrabrown.com will get you there or Google Sandra Brown. Uh, <laughs> I'm usually right above Sandra Bullock. So... <laughs> I'm easy to find. 
<laughs> yeah, same here. You can find me at Lisa Scatolini everywhere and on social media as well. And and I know that Sandra is the same way. It's really us because we write to each other all the time on Twitter. <laughs> So we're happy to hear from any of you. And just also know that we do love our jobs. We didn't want you to think too negative. It's just, that's it's still, that is it's still the best job in the world. We're, lo- we're so we, lucky. We we're so to, blessed. We get to make believe for a living. I right. Mean, that's, right. That's pretty hard to beat. And thanks to awesome stores like Tattered and all the people who support it and support Thank us. Thank you very much, Tattered Cover. Thank you. And before everyone logs off, I, uh, Want to thank you all for joining. We are tired to cover here in Denver. Please visit us when you feel comfortable traveling. Get Sandra Brown's Flying Tiger. Get Lisa Scalini's books. Get all of them at tatteredcover.com. Thank you, ladies, so much for an amazing evening. And hope to see you soon. Thank, thank you. Better. Thank you, Sandra. Love you. Love you. Bye. Bye-bye.